Okay. This is lecture number 3 on protein structure. Last time we discussed about the importance of protein structure and I just want to go through this slide once more to show how important the property of an amino acid is in for the in this case actually giving you disease. Okay. So, what happens here is you have a difference in the folding of the protein. Okay. The reason why we have this change is because of a specific genetic mutation. This is what is called a mutation, an amino acid mutation where we have glutamic acid go to valine. Now, because of this mutation, we have a hydrophobic residue on the surface and the because of this property is entirely different from the glutamic acid, we have these sequestering together or sticking together to form a fiber which is what is going to give disease. So, the folding of the protein is extremely important and there are certain forces associated with the folding of the protein which we will be doing later on. But for now, we are going to understand more of how we can actually get to solving protein structures because now we know that we have this amino acid sequence. We know that we can get a secondary structure out of it. From that, we can get a tertiary structure finally to a quaternary structure. Fine. So, if we want to look at or how to get a protein structure, there are actually only two kinds of techniques that are available to get atomic resolution pictures because you want to know exactly where the atoms are which are going to tell you what your protein looks like. Okay. And you understand that it is an extremely large system. So, it is a macromolecule. So, it is very difficult to pinpoint where the atoms are if you were to take a snapshot of it. Now, there are two techniques available. One is X-ray crystallography and the other is NMR spectroscopy. Now, X-ray crystallography is by far the, on, the only method that is still taken to date as to the method to solve a protein structure, but NMR spectroscopy is actually very fast catching up. Now, the, dif the difficulty of X-ray crystallography is getting a crystal. Now, you understand if you want to do crystallography, you have to have a crystal of the protein. Okay? Now, getting a protein crystal is very, very difficult because of its large size. It actually either forms a powder or it just sticks together and does not form a crystal at all. So, if you do not have a crystal, you cannot do crystallography and that is why it is very difficult to get protein crystals, which is why people are going to what is called protein structure prediction. Okay, because it is easy to get the sequence of the protein. You can find out the amino acid sequence of the protein very easily, a method that we will be studying also. And to get this from the sequence to the structure is what the problem is. Now, the reason why we need to know the structure is because of the following reasons. The structure is going to help us understand the function, the mechanism, evolution. It is going to help us with what is called structure based drug design and it is also going to help us basically solve the protein folding problem because we will have more structures from which we can identify which amino acid sequence folds into which structure. So, say we have something like this. What is this? We have a random coil, we have an alpha helix, we have a beta strand and we have an alpha helix here. What we want to know is this is say the sequence in one letter code. What do I want to know? I want to know whether H means helix, C means coil and E means extended sheet. That is what the nomenclature here is H, C, E. H is helix, C is coil and E is extended sheet. Now, what I want to know therefore, is if I have this sequence, how I can actually say which part is going to be a helix, which part is going to be a coil and which part is going to be a sheet. That is going to help me in my analysis. Okay. Now, this I am going to mention something about this because this is a very current topic of investigation, a very current topic of research, which is called the protein folding problem. Now, just consider this. Okay. If you have a 100 residue protein, you know now what does that mean? It means you have 100 amino acids in your polypeptide chain. Now, if we consider 
that each residue can take only three positions. What do I mean by that? You know that you can have rotations about the bonds in the amino acids that connect the amino acids together. So, if actually it can take on many more positions, but if I consider that this 100 residue polypeptide chain can actually take on only three positions, then there are 3 to the 100, 100 possible conformations for this polypeptide chain, okay? which is about 10 to the 47 possible conformations. Now, the protein folds in one single structure as we show, I showed you in the first day itself when we looked at ribonuclease A, that is the only structure it falls into. So, of the 10 to the 47 possible conformations that are available for a certain protein, that is only 100 amino acid residues long. If the protein decides it wants to fold into a specific protein and it took less than a picosecond to determine whether it was going to fold into any one of these possible conformations, then it would take 10 to the 27 years for a single protein to fold, which it does in a matter of milliseconds. Okay? So, it knows exactly how it supports to fold. And where is this information? It is in this sequence. All the information is in this sequence and this is the big question that is still unanswered. We do not know how a particular sequence of amino acid residues that is the primary structure is going to go to which tertiary structure. Because you understand based on the conformational flexibility, there are a very large number of conformations available to it, but it will fold it into a single structure. It is like that in, um, example I give you of the necklace. You have a necklace of beads. You pick it up, drop it on the table. It is never going to fall in the same conformation twice. You have even 2D, it will not do that and 3D, forget about it. Okay? So, the whole problem of protein folding is given a particular sequence of amino acid, what is the tertiary structure going to be? But what we can do is we can go for small predictions. We can say from the structures that are already available, how say this particular sequence might form a helix or might form what is called, we can find out which part is going to be in the central region of the protein by determining what? Determining which are hydrophobic in nature. Okay? So, if I find a stretch of amino acids that are going to be hydrophobic in nature, what can I say about them? I can say that they might be forming the central part of the folded protein. That is some information I can get which I will be a bit better off than just the primary sequence of the protein. So, how do we do that? This is what is called a hydropathy plot. Okay? What is a hydropathy plot? It is a graphical display of the local hydrophobicity of the amino acid side chains in a protein. And why do I want to do that? I know, remember I showed you a table which I will show you again, which gives you the hydrophobicity values of different amino acid residues. If you have a positive value, then you have hydrophobic residues. If you have a negative value, you have a water exposed region or a hydrophilic region. Okay? These hydropathy plots are actually most useful in predicting transmembrane segments, but for now we will know how we can find a hydrophobic region and what am I going to do with the hydrophobic region? I will then predict that this hydrophobic region forms the center of the protein because I know that the, the protein is a hydrophobic core with a hydrophilic surface to it. Okay? And then we learnt in the previous class how we can say whether a helix that is on the surface, we can tell which part is going to be inside and which part is going to be outside. So, now I will be slightly better off in saying about the whole protein sequence as to determining which part is going to be in the middle of the protein and which part is likely to be on the surface of the protein. Okay. So, what do we have here? 
this is a hydrophobicity scale. This I showed you in one of the previous classes and what do we have here? For the positive values we have hydrophobic residues, the negative values are hydrophilic residues. Now what can I do with this? I can go, th go to what is called a hydropathy plot. It is called a sliding window approach. Now I am going to go through it very slowly and we are going to plot a hydropathy plot to determine whether a part of a protein is going to be on the surface or whether a part of a protein is going to be in the center of the protein. So what do we do? We have, the cal we have to calculate the property for a subsequence. What do I mean by a subsequence? Say I have this as my amino acid sequence. Okay? So let us just write this down. We have what is I? I is isoleucine. Then we have leucine, another isoleucine, lysine, glutamic acid, isoleucine, arginine. Okay? What I need to know now is from the table how I can determine which part is inside, which part is outside. So what do I do? I have a specific sequence that I have here. I now take the values for these amino acid residues and take the average of them. Okay? So what do I do? Let us just, let's just put another amino acid here, say Gly and Ala. So the first thing I, that I do here is I add the value for isoleucine. Now the value for isoleucine is 4.5, the value for leucine is 3.8, 4.5, lysine is minus 3.9. Why is it minus? Because it is hydrophilic in nature. Glutamic acid is minus 3.5, isoleucine is 4.5. Arginine is minus 4.5, glycine is minus 0 0.4 and alanine is 1.8. Okay. Now we, this is called a sliding window approach. So this is my residue number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. I take the first 7 residues that is called my window. I take a window of 7. I take the average of these. So what do I have to do? I have to add them all up and divide by 7. You can work that out and we find out that we get a value of what is the value that we get? We add all these up together from 1 through 7 and then we get a value which I will show on this slide here. We have to add 4.5 plus 3.8 plus 4.5 minus 3.9 minus 3.5 plus 4.5 minus 4.5. What does that total come to? Did you work it out? The total comes to 5.40. What do we want? We go back to the slides here. We will, we have the total as 5.4. We want the average of this. So we divide by 7, 0.77. This is assigned to the central residue. So residue number 4 in this case is going to have a hydropathy index value, average hydropathy index value of 0.77. Then what do we do? We move to the next window. 
we are a sliding window approach. So, what do I have to do now? I have to go from 2 to 8. When I go from 2 to 8, I have to add all these numbers from leucine, isoleucine, lysine, glutamic acid, isoleucine, arginine and glycine together. And then I have to divide by 7 again. So, 5.40 divided by 7 gave me this that is assigned to the central residue. So, this is assigned to residue number 4, right. If I take the other set, then what am I going to lose? I am going to lose 4.5 from this and add minus 0 0.4 basically. So, what am I going to lose from 5.40? So, what is my value going to be for number 5? I will have a specific value here. So, if I add all these values together from 2 that is 3.8 plus 4.5 minus 3.9 minus 3.5 plus 4.5 minus 4.5 minus 0 0.4 I am going to get what? 0 point, what do I have to do? Divide by 7, that is going to give me, so how much I am going to get here? 0 0.07, so then what do I do again? This is assigned to residue number 5, then I have to slide my window once more. Well, actually you have to do this through the whole protein, but we are not going to do it now. So, I have to go from now residue 3 to 9. Then I get another value that I assign to residue number 6 and so on. Eventually, what am I going to get? I am going to get values from leaving out the first 3 residues and the last 3 residues. I am going to get values for the average hydrophobicity for the set of amino acids that formed this particular window, right. Then what you can do is make a plot, okay. Now basically you can, uh, you understand that you can change the window size we can make it a 9 residue window or an 11 residue window. We make it an odd residue window so that we can assign it to the central amino acid, okay. Usually what happens is if you have a small window, you have noisier plots. We will look at a plot and see what it looks like. This is a usually 9 or 11 is used. We have used 7, but that is fine. Now this is when we have membrane helices, this is something I was mentioning in the previous class, okay. We have our lipid bilayer, we have the cytoplasmic face and we have the inside basically and the outside. Now, if we look at the types of residues that we have here, we understand now from the helical wheel which are going to be hydrophilic in nature and which are going to be hydrophobic in nature. Now, if we have a membrane that is around 30 angstroms. We know that the rise per amino acid residue is 1.5 angstroms. What is that? That is the vertical rise per amino acid residue. The pitch that we saw was for a complete turn, right? That was 5.4 angstroms for a complete turn. And this is for a single amino acid, we have 1.5 angstroms. Now, if I know that my membrane is 30 angstroms thick, then how many hydrophobic residues should I have there? 20. Why? Because each 
1.5 angstroms is for every amino acid residue. I have to span 30 angstroms. So, if I had a helix or if I had a stretch, let, let's not call it the helix right now. If I have a stretch of amino acid residues that actually form a helix here that were to span the whole membrane, I know if it were a single helix, all of them would be hydrophobic in nature. Why? Because I have my lipid hydrophobic tails that have to interact with the helix, right? So, what can I do? I can say that when I am spanning the membrane, this is my membrane, I am spanning the membrane with a helix. What is the nature of the residues in this helix? They are hydrophobic in nature, right? Now, so all the ones that are sticking out here, all the residues that are the side chains that are out here are going to be hydrophobic in nature. Now, what I need in such a specific protein sequence is I need a stretch of 20 amino acids, 20 amino acids, why? Because I have a 30 angstrom, what is 30 angstrom? It is the thickness of the membrane, okay? So, I have a 30 angstrom stretch and I know that for every amino acid, I traverse 1.5 angstroms in height. So, the rise is 1.5 angstroms per amino acid. So, I need 20 amino acids to what type of amino acids? Hydrophobic. hydrophobic. How do I determine that? I construct a hydropathy plot. Okay. Now, what we did find for the hydropathy plot, this is going to be the index. Here on the y axis, we are going to have an index. And on the x axis, is going to be the sequence of the protein, sequence. So, we have the amino acid sequence on the x axis and we have the index. What, what is this index? It is the average index that we found out in the previous slide. So, if I have residue 1 here, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on. Then, where was my, I had a sliding window, what was my sliding window size? 7. Size was 7. So, what do I have now? I assign the first value to residue number 4 which was in this case 0.77. So, this is positive, this is negative. So, somewhere say if this is, let us mark 1, 2, 3. So, if this is 1, this is 2 and this is 3. So, 0 0.77 is somewhere here. I just make a plot. Then when I, when the window slid over, from residue from instead of from 1 through 7, which I assigned to residue number 4, I went from 2 to 8, which I assigned to residue number 5. That came out to be 0 0.07. So, that was very low down here. So, I can complete a whole plot for the protein, right? What do you need for this? What do you need? To construct a hydropathy plot, you need the sequence of the protein and you need the hydrophobicity values. That is all the information you need. Okay? So, we have our amino acid sequence and we also have the hydrophobicity indices. Then I have to find the average depending upon my window size. 
then say I have a plot like this. That is possible. This region is positive, this region is negative. Now, if we go back to the data in our slides here, what can I say about what can I say about the positive regions? They are hydrophobic in nature. So, if I have now you understand when you take the average a hydrophilic residue counteracts the effect of a hydrophobic residue, right. But if you had a stretch of hydrophobic amino acids only, this value would be a high positive value. If you had a high positive value, what can you say? You can have a stretch therefore, of highly hydrophobic amino acid residues. So, when we look at this and I say that this stretch is a highly hydrophobic stretch, when I am talking about a normal protein that is not a membrane protein, I can safely say that this part is going to be or form part of the central part of the protein, the central core of the protein. Why? Because it is hydrophobic in nature it will not be on the surface. But usually when we do these hydropathy plots, they are mainly done for membranes because it tells you that this region is probably spanning the membrane. Why? Because if I have said my residue is from say approximately number 20 to number 45 here. So, what is my stretch of amino acids? I have approximately 25 amino acids that are hydrophobic in nature and I know that this is a membrane protein. What can I say about it? I can say that this part forms the helix. I can very safely say that it is this part that is forming the helix of my membrane protein. Why? Because this part is hydrophobic in nature and I know that if I have a single transmembrane helix, all of the residues have to interact with the lipid bilayer which is hydrophobic in nature. So, I can plot a hydropathy plot that is going to tell me which region is going to be hydrophobic in nature and which region is going to be hydrophilic in nature. Okay. So, I can say that these regions are going to be on the surface and I can say that these regions are going to be buried in the core of the protein. And for a transmembrane helix, I can say it is going to be on the membrane side. Now, usually as I mentioned, the hydropathy analysis is used to locate transmembrane segments usually, but you can also do it for a regular protein. Because the reason being that not many structures of transmembrane helix proteins are known and what is the main signal? A stretch of hydrophobic and helix loving amino acids. What do we mean by helix loving amino acids? Residues that are likely to form an alpha helix, right. So, that is what a hydropathy plot would look like. This is a hydropathy plot for a rhodopsin, the one that I showed you on top, the structure. So, what can I say? All these positive parts, if the, see this is number, this is residue number 50 to 100, 150, 200, 250, 300. So, these are stretches that are larger than 20 amino acid residues, okay. Based on the scale, if it goes from 0 to 350, then these are larger than 20. So, what can I say? I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 probably helices. What are these helices? They are interacting with the 
lipid bilayer of the membrane because rhodopsin is a membrane protein. So, this is a typical hydropathy plot that you can see and what, what is the information that you get from this? You understand now that if you have a stretch of hydrophobic amino acids, then this is going, this is a region that is going to be the helix part of the transmembrane protein or this is going to be the transmembrane segment rather. This is going to be the helix that is going to interact with the lipid bilayer of the membrane. Okay? So, this is a very simple plot. Again, what, do, what is the information you need? All the information you need is the sequence and the table. Right? You can also construct a helical wheel. What is the information you need for the helical wheel? Just the sequence, nothing else because you know that for every amino acid you are going to rot the rotation is 100 degrees. So, all you need for the construction of the helical wheel is the amino acid sequence. What you need for the hydropathy plot is additionally the hydrophobicity values of the amino acid residues. So, these are two other proteins where you can figure out this is bacteriorhodopsin and this is glycophorin. Now, what do we have here? So, you know which stretch is hydrophobic now? right? We know which stretches are hydrophobic, which are mostly hydrophilic in nature. Now, if this were for a normal protein say, then what could you say about these regions? You could say, say that res region number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 would form the inner core of the protein, the central part of the protein. So, you could safely say that these probably were on the outside. So, would you would be better off then just having the sequence of the protein and no idea as to how the protein is folding. This is how gradually people, they are not as good as predicting the protein structure, but the researchers that are going up to at least 70, 77 percent today, okay, but that is still not good enough. Okay. The reason being that the primary sequence we know for over 200,000 proteins and the crystal structures we know for 25,000, which is miserable. Okay? Considering that only if you know the structure of the protein can you say the function or you can design a drug that is going to act on it, knowing the sequence for 200,000 proteins and the crystal structure only for 25,000 proteins does not lead us anywhere. Okay? So, we have to know what the structures of all these proteins are going to be and we have to go for these prediction methods. Okay. So, what, what does this give you an idea of? This gives you and first of all we learned from a helical wheel from the just the sequence. If I know the sequence is going to form a helix, then what can I say? I can say whether which part of the helix is going to be inside, which is going to be outside. Now, if we are looking at the sequence of this and I know from the hydrophobicity indices where I have a hydrophobic region. I can safely say that this hydrophobic region is going to form part of the protein, core of the protein, right? But in this case, when we are talking about transmembrane segments, these are the regions that traverse the membrane. Okay. So, now we want to go for secondary structure prediction. I want to know where a helix is going to form. So, I am a bit bolder now. I had my sequence. Okay. From my sequence, I could construct a helical wheel. But what is the idea of constructing a helical wheel if you do not know where the helix is going to be? Okay? You cannot keep on doing it for the whole protein. You can do it, you can do the hydropathy index plot for the whole protein and then figure out which regions are going to be inside or outside. But if I want to do a secondary structure prediction, what does it mean? You have to remember that you have the protein sequence always available to you. That is always available to you. You do not have the structure always available. So, if we want to construct a three state model, we have the helix, the strand and the coil. Okay? So, we have basically, basically an alpha, a beta and a turn. These are just some numbers. So, we need another table if we want to go for secondary structure prediction. This is the, it was done I think in 1977. It is a very famous uh, way or very easy way rather to predict whether you have a helix or not. These are called the chow Fassmann parameters. Okay? What it tells you is it tells you 
that the chance or rather the propensity, this value is called a propensity that you are going to have an alanine in an alpha helix. Okay? The larger the number, the larger the probability that that helix is going to be in that specific secondary structure. So, let us go through it once more. What this table tells you is that you see all the 20 amino acids here. It tells you that the numbers here tell you whether these amino acids are going to form A's that is alpha helices, B's that is beta strands or coils that is turns. Okay? Because what do you want to do? You have your protein sequence. You want to know where your loops, this is L that is another uh, notation that is also used apart from C. So, you want to know where the coils are or the turns or the loops are. You want to know where the helices are and you want to know whether the sheet, where the sheets are. Okay? Because that will give you a better idea of how your protein is going to fold because you will have some information from your hydrophobicity. You will sa have some information about the secondary structure. So, that will lead you into a better idea of how your protein is actually going to form its tertiary structure from its amino acid sequence. So, how do we do this? Again, we have the sequence of the protein. From the sequence of the protein, you just have to look at the numbers. You do not even have to calculate anything now. You just look at the numbers. If 6 out of 6 contiguous numbers or rather 6 contiguous amino acids, if 4 of them have a PA value greater than 100, then a helix is going to form. So, you are not doing any mathematics also. You are just putting the numbers down. Okay? So, let us just go back to the previous slide. So, if I had a helix, you can just make up a helix. Like, let us look at this. We know where the helix begins here. So, M, Q, G, V, V, T. M is greater than 100. So, we have 1 greater than 100. Q, Q is what? Q is glutamine greater than 100. So, I have 2 out of 2 greater than 100. G is glycine 57, less than 100. So, I am 2 out of 3. V 106, 3 out of 4. Again V, 4 out of 5. T, threonine, 83. So, I have to go a bit further. Am I right here? M, Q, G, V, V, T. So, we have to have 4 that are greater than 100. Do I have 4? I have M, Q, V, V out of the 6 M, Q, G, V, V, T. So, I can say that I have a helix here. What do I have? H, 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 H. Okay? So, it is very simple. You just look at it. What about the next one? Then, we extend the region until 4 amino acids with PA less than 100 are found. So, you keep on doing that. So, all you have to do is you just have a slide basically, a sliding window again, where you are looking at a window size of 6. What is this 6 telling you? That if you have 4 out of these 6 that have a PA value that is greater than 100, then you have an alpha helix. If your PA value is less than 100, you do not have an alpha helix anymore. How do you look for a beta sheet? If your PB now is greater than 100, 4 out of 6 for your PB is greater than 100, then you have a beta sheet. So, it is very simple. The problem arises when the alpha and the beta region overlap. Then what you have to do? Then you have to do some mathematics. Then you have to sum the PA value of the 6 residues, sum the PB value of the 6 residues, whichever is higher, it is going to be that. Okay? So, very simple. And what information do you have? A lot of information. You have 
from the amino acid sequence, you can now actually say whether you have a helix or not. So, now it will make sense from an understanding of whether you have a helix or not, whether it is going, then you can construct a helical wheel and then say which part is going to be outside and inside. Okay? So, we are gradually getting to know more and more of the structure. So, we have a helix that is 4 out of 6 residues with high helix propensity. Now, I think I should explain to you what propensity means before we go any further. Now, when we say, I am talking about propensity, it is sort of a probability, but you see the numbers are greater than 100. In some tables, you might see like we have the P alpha for alanine is 142. In some papers or books, this is sometimes put as 1.42, okay? but it is in that case, when you do or when you try to predict whether you have a helix or not, you will just be looking for values instead of 100, look for 1, as simple as that. Now, we are talking about a propensity value here. A propensity value is, now the way Chow and Fassman got all these numbers was by what is called a statistical analysis on the structures that are available. Okay? What do I mean by structures are available? The crystal structures that are solved for proteins are available in what is called the protein data bank. Okay? It is now freely available where you can download protein structures. What do we mean by protein structures? Is you have the x, y and z coordinates for all the atoms except the hydrogens because x-ray crystallography cannot look at hydrogens. So, if I am looking at residue number 1, I am going to have a nitrogen for residue number 1. Residue number 1 will also have a C alpha atom associated with it. Residue number 1 will also have a carbon atom associated with it that is for part of the carboxyl group. Residue number 1 also will have an oxygen associated with it. What do I need to draw it? I need these values. Right? Only if I have these values, can I draw it in three dimensional space? Right? So, the protein data bank gives you these values for the 25,000 structures that are available in it. Okay? So, now when I go to residue number 2, it starts again with the nitrogen because I am going from the amino terminus to the carboxyl terminus, right? So, then if you had a side chain, you would have apart from a C alpha, you would also have a C beta, right? So, the C beta would be written after this. So, this would be the backbone, then you would have a C beta and so on. But what we need to know is we need to know that there are a set of structures available for which you can do an analysis. What is that analysis? What you do is you say for the analysis that was done here, say you look at all the helices that are there in the proteins, right? And you count the number of alanine that are there in the alpha helix. You count the number of residues in the alpha helix, all the residues that are there in alpha helix only. Then you count the number of alanine in the database. including the ones in the alpha. So, you, calcu you calculate all the alanines that are there. You calculate the number of residues that are there in the database, which whichever database you are using. Okay? The propensity is a ratio. It is a ratio of the number of ala in alpha divided by the number of residues in alpha, the number of ala in the database divided by the number of residues 
in the database. So, what does it tell me? This is your propensity calculation. If this number is greater than 1, because you have to remember that you are looking at a large sequence, a polypeptide sequence of a large set of proteins. You want to know whether alpha is preferred in helices. What do I mean by that? If I look at this, this will give me some idea as to whether alpha is preferred in helices or not, because this gives me the number of alanine in the whole database, right. So, if I have say 8 percent of alanine in the whole database, I can calculate these as a percentage. Say I have a hundred residue, a thousand residues in the database say and hundred of them are alanine. That is possible. Of the thousand residues in the database, 200 are there in alpha helices of which 20 are alanine. So, what would my value be? 20 by 200, 100 by 1000. What is it? 1. What does it tell me? There is nothing great that I have in helices. I just have it 10 percent as I have in the rest of the protein. I do not have any information about it, but if I had 50 of these that were alanine, my value then would be greater than 1. Then in the normal case of a protein that I see here, I see more of alanine in helices, which makes it significant. Okay? So, that is how they came up with these numbers in our slide here. So, 1.42 which is the way you have it in a lot of tables. So, 1.42 means that this number is greater than 1. It means that al alanine would like to be in alpha helix, but about let us think of a proline. All of you know what a proline looks like? It will break the helix. Why? Because you cannot have it turn properly. It is an amino acid that bends onto itself. So, the propensity of it to form an in an alpha helix should be very low. Look at the value, it is 57. So, is glycine very low. Why? Because it does not like to be in an alpha helix or it is not seen rather in an alpha helix for the analysis that has been done for this set of proteins, which is true for mostly all the sets. Now, if I look at a turn, turns have mostly glycine and proline. The glycine because of its flexibility, proline because it is an amino acid, it basically helps in the turn back of the chain at times. So, look at these numbers 152 and 156 pretty high, asparagine is also high. Okay? So, that is how these propensity values were actually determined. The propensity values have since been determined again for a very a larger set of amino acids, but this table is still used today for a rough prediction of where your alpha helix or your beta sheet is going to be. Okay? So, what do we need? We just need to have that table to figure out where our helix is going to be and where our sheet is going to be and the rest of it is going to be coiled. There are, there are turns also, you have a turn set also here, a p turn here also. Okay. So, this is our table and this is our sequence. Okay. So, what do I have? I have my T, S, P, T, A, E. What have I put in here? I have put in values S is 77, 
t is supposed to be 83, but it is 69 here, which I do not know why. Anyway, so what we have is we have our threonine, serine, proline, and so on and so forth. Now, when I am at this point, how many do I have that are greater than 100? Just 2. So, I cannot say that I have a helix formation. I slide my window down to serine. I have an additional one greater than 100, but it is still 3 out of 6, not good enough. So, I slide it again. What do I have now? 4 out of 6. So, what can I say now? My helix begins. Okay? Your helix begins basically just after the proline here. But what you need to know is you have a sequence. And what can you say from the sequence? You can say from the sequence and from the table where your helix is going to be, where your sheet is going to be and where your turn is going to be. Okay? Then based on that, what we can do is we can from this information roughly determine from the sequence of a protein. So, I now have my sequence 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. What can I say? I can say that I have a helix here. I have say a turn here and then I have a sheet here or something like that. So, I can say basically it should be more like this. So, it, we can say what we have. Then what do I do? I can do a hydropathy plot. What is a hydropathy plot going to tell me? It is going to tell me which parts of these are hydrophobic in nature. So, say I say this, this part is hydrophobic and again this part is hydrophobic. So, what can I say? I can say that this part is going to be inside, that is going to be outside, that is going to be outside, then this part again is going to be inside. So, what do I have? some information of how the protein is going to fold. right? So, I can go from my primary sequence to some idea of what it is going to look like. Then I can also determine whether I am right. If I construct a helical wheel for this now, I can also construct a helical wheel for this. What would I expect in this one? This face would be hydrophobic because now you know this turn can rotate basically I can have a rotation about this which would make either face in or out right. Then what would I have to do? Construct a helical wheel. If I know that this face is high, if this face is hydrophobic I have to turn it around to make it come to the core of the protein. So, I have a hydrophobic region and a hydrophilic region this is therefore on the outside. So, I am better off in determining how my protein is going to interact, how it is going to fold into giving me my final tertiary structure. Okay? So, what we learnt is that we can from the chow Fassman parameters determine where we might have the helix. We can determine from a hydropathy plot where we can have the hydrophobic regions or where we can also have transmembrane segments and we can from the helical wheel determine, determine whether this part is outside or inside. Okay? So, we are better off than we are with just the primary amino acid sequence of the protein. Okay? We stop here today. Thank you.